Okuma Media's Polity, I'm Tabi Shomulikai. Joining me today is Distinguished Professor of Education at Stellenbosch University, Jonathan Johnson, here to unpack his memoir titled Breaking Bread. Can you talk to us about the title of your memoir, Breaking Bread? Yes, the title has both a literal and a symbolic meaning. The literal meaning refers to the fact that I grew up in a conservative evangelical church called the Brethren. And every Sunday morning, you would have the breaking of the breads. Other churches would call it Holy Communion and names like that. But for us, it was the breaking of bread. And a lot of my attraction as a kid uh, to the uh, to this particular church that my parents brought us into was the simplicity, the profound you know, meanings associated with uh, breaking bread, which meant eating bread and wine and so on. So there's a one meaning. But the other meaning, which is a very different one, means uh, symbolically for me, breaking bread beyond this conservative, exclusive fellowship to mean that when I sit down for Shabbat with my Jewish friends or I sit down and break fast with my Muslim friends, I'm, I'm breaking bread. But I'm breaking bread in a much more inclusive way, in a way that recognizes other people and how they live, and in a way that is, for me at least, later in life, a very, very fulfilling experience. So literally, where I grew up in the church, symbolically stretching beyond the church to embrace uh, all our people and breaking bread with them. And talking about growing up in a church, can you tell us how your parents' faith shaped your life, learning and leadership? Right. So there was a, a huge upside to growing up in this conservative church because I was shielded in, in many ways from the worst, you know, that happened around us. I saw gangs, but it was foreign to me. I saw men beating up their wives. It's foreign to me. I saw drugs and, and alcohol abuse. It was foreign to me. So the, the big upside of this evangelical upbringing meant that you were shielded from the worst excesses of what I saw in the Cape Flats. The downside, of course, was that you thought you were better than everybody else, that only you were going to heaven and everybody, Anglicans, Methodists, <laughs> Muslims, and Hindus all going to hell. I'm embarrassed to say that, but that is, of course, how I was raised. So there's pluses and minuses here. Very much protected, living in a bubble. At the same time, learning the bad habits that go with that, that to, to elevate yourself above others. You talk of your father's disappearance and how you completed suicide after what you discovered about his disappearance. Can you tell us more about this? Yeah, so, you know, like for most boys, you know, your dad is your role model. Uh, you look up to your dad. He was uh, he was my absolute role model. And, and when he disappeared, I was very puzzled, in part because nobody spoke about it. Obviously, those days, your parents didn't talk to you about big people's, you know, problems. And, and when I found out by mistake why he had disappeared, and I discovered there was another woman involved in all of that, I was absolutely devastated and um, found it difficult to, to sort of show respect, found it difficult to, you know, and when he eventually came back, that it was a really difficult time for me. But uh, when I discovered his absence, I, I did try to, to, to end my life because, uh, you know, and it's the first time it, it ever happened to me, and it's also the last time that it ever happened to me. And so I also learned subsequently that for any boy in particular, you know, uh, any child, I suppose, but especially for boys and dads, you know, that rupture that happens when your dad disappears or whatever the case may be, it has a huge emotional effect on you, precisely because you love them, precisely because you look up to them. And that, that was that was stuff. And can you tell us about how two important role models came into your life to smooth your academic path? Yeah, at about the same time, uh, I was fairly average in primary school and in junior high school. And I only went to school to play soccer. I mean, everything else was quite boring, actually. And one day during a, a break, my Latin teacher called me aside and said, you know, uh, 
you have huge potential. You, you pretend you know nothing, but you're actually very smart. Nobody had told me that before. And so that played on my mind, you know, what if the teacher is right? And so I decided that night I was going to prove it right. And around the same time, a boy my age, probably 15, comes into my life, also loves soccer like me, we meet at church. And he, unlike myself, went to a slightly better school. In fact, the school has got a good reputation in the black community. And he studied very hard. He studied throughout the night on a Friday. He, <laughs> he, had, he had, I think, on average, much better teachers than I had. And I was so impressed by him and his commitment to study, having now been buoyed initially by the words of this Latin teacher, that those two factors made a huge difference in my life. And I don't think I ever since came second in class again to anyone, uh, either in South Africa or in the United States. And not because I'm wonderful, but simply because somebody took the time to tell me what I could do and not what I could not do. And I suspect that's also why I went into teaching eventually, because I knew that if you can influence the lives of 40 kids times six, seven classes a day, just with good teaching, just with encouraging words, just imagine how you can change a nation. And to this day, high school teacher, I love university teaching, but high school teaching is still my personal. And can you tell us about your time at the University of the Western Cape and also why you did not go to the University of Cape Town as that was the university that was closest to your home? That's correct. It was saving me a lot of money and a lot of time. Going to UCT from where I lived in retreat in the southern suburbs. But UCT, I inquired there one day, you know, uh, after I finished writing the trick and uh, two white women looked at me with that kind of look. It's hard to describe unless you understand English racism. And I, and they made it very clear to me, despite the fact that um, I had a first class pass, which was very rare those days, uh, in our schools. And it was clear they thought I didn't meet the standard. And so, of course, I had to go where I didn't want to go, which is hit on the sea, partly because it was far away and partly because I didn't recognize or regard myself as colored. And there was another way of getting into UCT, of course, and that was by the permit system where the university on your behalf would write to the minister of interior or some minister to give permission for black students to study there, provided they were doing subjects that were being done at your designated university, which was here of the sea. That I found quite humiliating. So anyway, against my my very judgment, I went to UWC. It, 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 I dropped out in the first year, partly because of political uprisings and partly because I didn't understand form of the cons and partly because it was so damn far away and my parents couldn't afford, you know, bus and train money and that kind of thing. And so on. So I absolutely hated my undergraduate years at the UWC. And there was nothing for me for it that I can remember fondly when they send me money from alumni. I don't even the same because I had a horrible experience. And I suppose when I became a dean and a vice chancellor, I did exactly the opposite of what happened to me. I put huge amounts of time and resources into the undergraduate experience. And I was, I wanted my undergraduate students to feel that this was the best time in their lives, whether it was in Durban or the police state and so on. And, and it's a way of sort of almost making up, you know, for what you didn't receive by making, uh, the lives of young people who are pleasant in a, in a hard place, especially for first generation students, which is uh, the university. And during your teaching days at Travs, you discovered an interesting approach to politics of education. Can you tell us about this approach? Yeah, so, you know, if you grew up in Soweto, you grew up with the notion, you might have, I don't know how old you are, but there was sort of a period in which people spoke about, you know, liberation of education later. In the Western Cape, and particularly in Cape Town, under the influence of the unity movement, a fairly elite kind of left movement, they didn't have reason like that. For them, education was liberation. Education didn't have to wait for liberation. And therefore, you went to school to learn how to be critical, to learn how to engage, to learn how to improve yourself, to learn to prove the apartheid masters wrong. 
I found that particular way of thinking about the education. I mean, I couldn't see the sense of taking two years from your education when the only people who benefit were white people, the capitalists and so on. So it added a particularly powerful resonance with my own political attitude and beliefs. And so I still believe that today, by the way, after apartheid, and the way in which to overcome colonial and apartheid effects legacies in schooling is to go to school, is to do well, is to prove for good or wrong that black people can do mathematics at a very high level. But you don't you don't withdraw from that system. And that's something I, I really enjoyed in the politics of the Cape at the time. And can you describe the inflection point that you experienced in your journey of racial reconciliation? Yeah, you know, I was like, I suppose many of us as black people, I was quite angry, you know, partly we having lost property on both sides of the family, partly having seen the humiliation of a, I mean, myself or of my family by, by the apartheid system, the white people in particular. You grow up with a sense of caution, a sense of judgment, a sense of needing to react, you know, when you saw something bad happening. And that was very much part of most of my younger life. And so on. And then I started to work at the University of Pretoria, which at the time I was the first black dean, and and at that point almost all the students in the undergraduate program were white. And even though I understood my responsibility to lead them responsibly, I also, you know, there's also something with my staff and with my students that I felt that and quite that yeah, I wasn't at peace, let's put it that way. And so one day a, a white man, a poor white man from Victoria West near Atlishville came to see me with his daughter and he came at night, which meant he, he, he wouldn't be seen by white people. And he said to me, pretty emotionally, you know, can you have a birthday for my daughter? She always wanted to become a teacher. And you must understand, it's not the issue today, but you must understand this in the early 2000s, right, the mid 2000s, that apartheid is still fresh in our memory. And here's a white man asking a black kid, you know, white father, for a person for his white kid. And in a flash, I saw not a white man, but my father. When, and I saw not a white girl, but myself. At the point when I had asked my father for money to go to first and he said we don't have money and he was very emotional about that. And that was a turning point for me because I then realized, you know, that at the end of the day, what we're sitting here with is a common humanity. That that girl was me, that that man was my dad. And that by thinking beyond the epidemics, by thinking beyond your pain and recognizing the pain of others, there is a power that comes with that, that enables you to transform institutions deeply, rather than to transform it simply on the basis of race or, uh, and so on. So, so that was a turning point for me. I felt a burden come off my back. I felt I could love people regardless of a Zimbabwean or South African, Muslim or Christian. But, you know, given my upbringing uh, in this very conservative in, in church environment, this was this was my liberation moment, and I'm very grateful to that girl and her father for that experience. And lastly, what lessons have you drawn from your life experiences that you think would be valuable for others to learn? I think it's important that you, you're smarter than you think. You know, the apartheid system had the unique ability to make us not believe our own capacity. By the way, that's also true for white kids in South Africa, white, white staff members, academics. Uh, it broke us all down. It made us less than what we could be. The whites, because they then thought they were superior, and they discovered, of course, that that's nonsense. Black people, because we thought we were inferior, you know, hopefully we can discover that that too is nonsense. And so when, when I'm in a grade 12 class at high school or a doctoral class here at the University of Stellenbosch, I spend so much of my time saying to students, I can teach you the skills, I can give you the knowledge, but first I need to get into your head and make you understand because I was there. I did not expect to, I didn't even know what a university was. <laughs> and look at all the things I've been blessed with. And I'm not special, I'm not unique. 
this can happen to any one of you. If I can just get that into the head of every South African learner in schools and every South African student in university, then you can change this country overnight. And of all the lessons, that is the most important one. You are indeed smarter than you think. That was Professor Jonathan Johnson speaking to Criminal Media's Polity about breaking bread.